Uh, two weeks ago, I introduced a series of summer sermons by defining the word mitzvah as something more than what it literally means, and that is a commandment, a law. It is an act that enables us to attain holiness and to invest our lives with sanctity. And I also said that in Jewish tradition we have many acts which are preceded by the recitation of a bracha, a blessing, a prayer that acknowledges that the act we are performing is something that we are commanded to do, but more than that, that act is an opportunity that enables us to attain a measure of holiness, of kedusha, something that truly benefits us emotionally and spiritually. And so when I first delivered a sermon way back in the 1980s about new mitzvot for our times, I suggested that there are at least four acts that constitute being a mitzvah, and that it might be appropriate to acknowledge the importance of those acts by preceding them with a blessing as well. And those acts, which eventually were incorporated into the Book of Prayers published by the Reform Rabbinate for use in our personal lives and in our homes, they were the act of signing the document that states our willingness to donate our bodily organs for transplantation, the act of donating blood, the act of signing a living will that unequivocally expresses our desires concerning what medical treatments we want either continued or halted, and the act of exercising our rights as citizens in a democracy to vote. But I also said that not all mitzvot either have a bracha, a blessing, or need a blessing. What is important is that we recognize that there are acts that are truly acts of holiness. Not just something we do, but something that has a greater purpose. And so tonight I want to share with you some thoughts about kashrut. And too often the word kashrut, or keeping kosher, is thought of as only applying to food. And while it's true that in our Jewish tradition, we have a rather complex set of dietary regulations, regulations that totally observant Jews abide by rather meticulously, and that less observant Jews might follow to one degree or another, or perhaps ignore them completely. Having said that, the real meaning of kosher is not simply related to diet and food. The term kosher, or more correctly in modern Hebrew, kasher, it basically means fit. And so it is not just certain foods that are fit, while others are not fit. There are also objects which are fit or not fit. Just look around us tonight, and it will, re it will reveal some of them. In our ark, there are seven Torah scrolls. A Torah scroll can be either kosher or not. Obviously, it has nothing to do with what the Torah scroll eats, right? A Torah scroll, what makes it non-kosher or non-fit to be used ritually would be any error or even one letter of the hundreds of thousands of letters in that scroll from the very beginning to the very end being damaged even to the slightest degree. Or a talit, a prayer shawl, is fit, it's kosher, if on its four corners the fringes, the tzitzit, are all properly knotted with the required number of knots and windings. And if even one knot or one winding is missing, on even one of the four fringes of the talit, the talit is no longer kosher 
or fit for ritual use. The same holds true of a mezuzah, the container that we place on the doorposts of our homes. If the cloth, the handwritten scroll, has even one letter wrong or faded or damaged, and that happens often just by reason of the elements, then the entire mezuzah, no matter how beautiful the case is, is no longer kosher. So you understand that kosher means fit, or that something is in compliance with halakha, with Jewish law. Now you also know that the word kosher has been appropriated to mean Jewish style. And so you can go to the market and you can buy kosher dill pickles or some other product. And all that the word kosher means there is that it has been prepared in Jewish tradition, though it may not be strictly kosher. Now, many Jews, whether they follow the dietary laws or not, think that the laws were set down long ago strictly for reasons of health. And one can easily point to the fact that long ago, long before refrigeration was as common as it is now, that yes, certain meat products, especially pork, could easily become contaminated if they were exposed to the air for too long, and that eating them could then result in one being afflicted with trichinosis, which is a parasitic disease caused by eating raw or uncooked pork or wild game infected with the larvae of a species of roundworm. And because of the possibility the possibility of being afflicted with this disease, Jews were forbidden to eat any pork products. That may be just one of a few cases where the laws of kashrut just happen, and I might say it happens coincidentally, to contribute to better health. But the same cannot be said of many of the other restrictions or components of that whole system of kashrut of dietary laws. For example, there is absolutely, and no one has ever maintained, that there is a health risk or a health benefit from eating meat and dairy products at the same meal. That was done for a totally different purpose. So if the purpose of the dietary laws is not to make for better health, then we have to think that there must be an other more compelling reason. A number of years ago, a very distinguished Orthodox rabbi and scholar, Emanuel Rachman, who went on to become the chancellor of Bar Ilan University in Israel, wrote an essay entitled Health, and holiness. And in that classic essay, he says that, hyge- that many moderns assume that hygienic considerations prompted God to ordain many of the commandments found in the Bible or in the Torah. And then he says that the major concern of the Torah and of the whole system of mitzvot, of commandments, and especially the dietary laws, was not hygiene at all. Its purpose was to add to the dignity and sanctity of the human personality. Now, I would add to that my belief that the ultimate purpose of the dietary laws was not to promote physical health, but was rather to involve Jews in the process of self-discipline. And indeed, many other communities, religious or cultural communities, have dietary laws or laws related to what you eat or what you don't eat, and those too are a form of self-discipline. Because to make determinations about what can be eaten and what can't be eaten was a very powerful exercise in self-discipline. 
And when deciding what to eat or what not to eat, that occurred regularly, something that one did each and every day, the Jew was reminded at least three times a day as he or she sat down for a meal that he or she was part of a people and that being part of that people, in the case of ours, the Jewish people, meant that one was charged with living a, in a particular manner, and that manner was to be a just, compassionate, sensitive human being. Other traditions or religions, cultures, may have developed their own ways of reminding their adherents of fundamental beliefs and behavioral, behavioral expectations. But we Jews were not left by our ancestors to our own devices. We were constantly and continuously being reminded who we are and reminded and taught what being a Jew ultimately demands of us and expects of us. As liberal Jews, we may choose to incorporate all or some of those traditions into our lives. Traditionalist Jews start with an assumption that they have no choice in this matter, that God has commanded those 613 commandments and all of their extensions, and it is their responsibility, their obligation, to follow or obey those commandments or those mitzvot. Now, all of this is a bit of an introduction to what I believe are some new ways of approaching the idea of mitzvot for our times. And I apologize for the length of the introduction, but I think it's necessary to understand what the concept of kosher really means. I've come to believe that our times demand some new approaches to religious living. And those approaches need to be grounded in the past, but also need to take cognizance of the present. Many years ago, a renowned scholar of Jewish law taught that Jewish laws of the past for liberal Jews, progressive Jews, have a vote, but not a veto. It's a very important concept that the past, that whole accumulation of Jewish law has a vote on what we do, but does not ultimately have a veto. And another fine scholar said that the aim of Jewish law for the modernist or liberal Jew is to guide, but not necessarily to govern. A couple of years ago, a group of conservative rabbis and you need to know that conservative Judaism essentially calls for its adherents to abide by Jewish law. That group of rabbis suggested that, in their words, in our modern world, it is hard to ignore that our food choices have ethical as well as ritual implications. And then they recognized, in their words, that in recent years, growing numbers of Americans, many of them Jewish, have voiced concerns about the many troubling aspects of our industrialized global food chain, whether it be the overuse of pesticides and antibiotics and its impact on public health and on the entire ecosystem, whether it's crowded and unsanitary conditions for livestock, slaughterhouses that are inhumane to both animals and workers, or even the environmental costs of shipping products all over the world. And then their statement says, and as we all know, just because an item on our plate is ritually kosher, for example, a piece of meat that's been bought in a kosher butcher shop, prepared in, in accordance with all of the laws, that doesn't mean it will not make us ethically queasy. And one of the things that prompted that statement, and then the subsequent creation of what they call Magain Tzedek, 
an ethical certification program intended to supplement kosher certification was the revelation that some of you may remember a couple of years ago of the shameful abuses that were taking place in one of the country's largest packagers of kosher meat and poultry in Iowa. Their products all complied with the rules of kashrut, but the way they treated their workers, the conditions under which their workers had to work were so blatantly unethical that no matter how rigorous the inspection of the methods of slaughtering were, it was concluded that their meat and their poultry could not and should not be considered kosher. The day may come soon when, in addition to seeing designations on food items, you know, the U with the O around it, which is the designation that the content and preparation of the, that particular food has been supervised and deemed acceptable by inspectors of the U, the Union of O Orthodox Jewish Congregations, or a parallel kind of designation, a K on some uh, products or some other designation, that the day may soon come when there will be an additional or a new seal on grocery shelves that assures us that the product adheres to the highest ritual, yes, and more importantly, the highest of ethical standards. And that has led me to feel that the time has come to differentiate between things other than food products and to consider them either kosher, namely fit for our consumption or use or not, the clothing that we buy and wear. If that clothing is made in sweatshops somewhere in the world, where little children may be forced to work under hazardous conditions and be paid indecent wages, that piece of clothing ought to be seen as traif, as unfit for our use, not kosher. Now, does that mean that there needs to be a label on shoes and clothing that indicate that they've been manufactured under ethical conditions? Of course not. It, rather, it becomes our responsibility individually to find out to the greatest extent possible whether what we are buying and using is kosher. And in that sense, I would say fit, ethically fit for us or not. And those determinations will be quite personal. And yet there are some standards that I think we can all apply to our judgment-making process, and that one overriding standard is tzedek, justice. Have just means been used in the manufacture or in the marketing of a product? If kashrut is, as I think it is, primarily a system to impose on us self-discipline, then we will make judgments as to what's permissible and what is not, what is fit and what is unfit and what is kosher or not in a new kind of way of looking at kashrut. Now, a long time ago, 54 years ago, when Rita and I were engaged to be married, the time came for her to go to the fancy store in Cincinnati that sold fine china and crystal. And she and her mother went and looked at lots of china patterns and finally decided on the one that they really liked. That was going to be on her bridal gift list. And she came to me and described it, and then she told me that it was Rosenthal china a product of Germany or Bavaria. And I told her that Rosenthal China would never be in our home. I told her that products of German and anti-Semitic companies like Volkswagen in those days, Krupps and Rosenthal China, were unfit for us. I probably didn't use the term then that I would use now. That is, Rosenthal China made in post-war Germany for me, was not kosher. It has nothing to do with the components of the china. It had to do with the fact that buying such china 
we were contributing to the success of a company that had been obviously complicit in the Holocaust. For us, it was Trafe. By the way, we do have a piece of Rosenthal china in our china cabinet, but it was one that belonged to my mother, and it was from pre-war Rosenthal china. While many acts can be recognized as being mitzvot, because we accompany them with the recitation of a blessing or a bracha, not all are so accompanied. What's needed is not a blessing. What's needed is a readiness to discipline our buying and using patterns by determining what's fit and what is not, what's ethical and what is not, what is kosher, what is fit for us and not. And to make those determinations is to engage in new mitzvot for our times. It's never too late to begin doing that, and there's no need to feel guilty if one is not consistent. What matters is that we guide our choices, that we guide our decisions, and that we guide our habits by a true recognition of what is truly ethical. To do that is, I think, to live by the new mitzvot for our times.